How are y'all? Good. So today I want to talk to you about two issues, wealth inequality and automation, and how I think automation is going to drive wealth inequality to sky-high levels that are completely unsustainable going forward in the next 50 years. Now, first I want to tell you a story about how I became interested in this. Uh, a few years ago, I was working in Istanbul, and this was right around the time of 2014 when the Syrian refugee crisis was kicking into high gear. Um, they were on the streets. I saw families. I saw mothers, brothers, sons, and daughters on the streets, exposed to the elements, no food. And it really struck me. because Sometimes I would have to actually step over these poor people in order to get into my office. And I thought to myself, it's kind of sad because the reason why they're here because they don't have access to little pieces of paper in their pocket. Because if they did, they could go get shelter over their head, they could go get some food, they could get what they needed, but they can't. Why? Because they're locked out of capital and through no fault of their own. They are fleeing from circumstances that are, in most cases, completely beyond their control something bigger than they are. So why does wealth inequality matter? Wealth inequality matters because you have to have, in our uh, society over the last centuries, capital. And I should make a distinction. Wealth inequality as opposed to income inequality. Income is what you make. And it certainly goes into wealth inequality and you know, your cost of living and how you can live. Wealth inequality is Everything. It could be a tangible asset, physical asset. It could be intangible. So it could be your car, your land, or you could have a business ownership interest. And why does that matter? Because if you own things, if you have access to capital, you get to mold the environment around you. You get to make society how you want it to. So society is an ecosystem. And it's a fragile ecosystem. And why wealth inequality matters is because if this ecosystem gets out of whack or out of balance, it goes away. The one thing we've seen that's constant in societies over the course of thousands of years is that things change. If this continues to go as it is right now, this is where we're going to end up, 1790s France. I don't know how many of you know your French history, but I'll go through a little bit. And in France, in the 1790s, after a few hundred years, hundreds of years of the nobility and the king, the queen, finally the majority of the people realized, this system isn't working for us. So what did they do? Well, they killed the king and queen, off with their heads, and they replaced the nobility, and they started a new system. Change is constant and it happens all the time. And I'm worried for our system if we keep going in the next 50 years because I learned some very interesting things in my research on when I was interested in the refugee crisis. Did you know, for instance, eight people in the world own as much as 50% of the world population? Did you know that? Eight people own more than three point eight billion people. Now we've all probably heard of the one percent versus the ninety-nine percent. One percent of the population owns as much as ninety-nine percent of the wealth. So clearly we have a distribution issue. <laughs> so this is where we are now. Now I want to talk to you a bit about an issue that I think is going to escalate this issue and drive it even higher. Automation. Artificial intelligence, deep learning algorithms, call it what you want to. Pretty much a different name for the same thing. So, 1970s, we have very few personal computers in houses, right? There's a few, but most people don't have them. Fast forward 20 years, we have the internet. It coming around. We have that. Then, 
Fast forward 2007, 10 years ago, the first smartphone, the first iPhone comes out. And it's amazing, right? And now, today, just 10 short years later, we have a phone on our wrist that can tell your glucose levels, that can tell you uh, anything you want to know, your heart rate. It can actually let you make calls, which is pretty amazing. There's more technology on your wrist, more computational power on there, than the computer that NASA used to send men to the moon. It's pretty incredible when you think about it. So technology is increasing rapidly. Now, let's look at how that pertains to wealth inequality and job automation. Automation is pretty, we kind of have an idea about what it is in regard to manufacturing, right? There used to be uh, 100 guys or 1,000 guys that would do lug nuts and put them in on a, on a car wheel. Well, now there's a robot to do all of those jobs. So we kind of have an idea about that. And some people say to me, you know, well, Adam, wealth inequality, these refugees, I feel bad for them and, you know, it's a noble cause, but what does that have to do with me? Well, because they say, well, my field isn't subject to automation. Well, I'm going to tell you some things here that might surprise you. For instance, lawyers. I'm a lawyer uh, by trade. And fellow lawyers, I hate to tell you, but I recently, one of the biggest law firms in New York City just replaced their entire entry-level bankruptcy department with Watson, artificial intelligence machine. That was 50 attorneys, and now they have Watson. I'm sorry, Watson. It's Ross. But Ross, get those names confused. Ross doesn't need sick time. Ross doesn't require vacation time. He doesn't need a benefits package. He just does what he's supposed to do, his task, every second, every hour, of every day until we tell them to stop. Doctors, I have bad news for you as well. Watson, actually Watson this time, Watson has proven more depth than human doctors at diagnosing tuberculosis, the existence of it or not, than human doctors. And it's not just in regard to tuberculosis, it's other specialties as well. Cardiology, there's ophthalmology, across different specialties. So that's going. Transportation. Transportation, we've all, I think, heard of probably Elon Musk and what he's doing with Tesla and the self-driving cars. Detroit is really pumping a lot of money. Billions of dollars by many different uh, companies are being pumped into transportation and self-driving transportation. In fact, Morgan Stanley estimates that by 2035, $2.1 trillion will be saved by not hiring human drivers to drive. It's an area of huge disruption. And it's all coming. And finance people, I'm sorry, I have to tell you as well. Now, algorithms, deep learning algorithms are now trading on the markets. They take a vast amount of data and then they analyze it in a split second and make trades faster than we ever could. And it's not just your stock traders in New York City or in Tokyo or in Chicago that are going to be affected by this. Your friendly resident financial advisor in your community, you can have a consumer go, put in their information, what's their salary, where are they going, what, what, kind of, what year they want to retire, and this algorithm, this AI, will spit out a financial plan for you. So let's talk about that. So if you don't have access to a job, what is a job? Let's break it down in essence. A job is a place where you go to and you trade your time for little pieces of paper, which you then go trade for what you really want. Do we really want the little pieces of paper? No, we want what we can buy. We want cars, we want shelter, we want food. So, 
if you can't go to this place in the next however many years and get, trade this time for money, how do you get what you need? In fact, they estimate that by 2026, up to 40% of the jobs are going to be automated. In India, that number is even greater. World Bank estimates it's 67% of jobs. 25% by 2021. So, how do you get what you want or what you need? This automation is increasing. Okay? And I'm not here to say that I think tech is bad. Full disclosure, I own a tech company. <laughs> so, obviously, I think they're good. I think technology can be good if we let it. I think it's going to work out. The issue is, where does it leave the average person in this world that we're going to? It's great for uh, the tech companies and the titans of industry who are the automators, the ones who are actually owning the artificial intelligence and the deep learning algorithms. It's going to work out great. Their profits are going to go up because they don't have to actually hire more employees. They can have one robot do what a thousand people could do. So I don't want to be all doom and gloom, though. I want to talk a little bit about solutions and how we might uh, have something of a dialogue going forward, because that's really all I'm here to do. I'm not trying to get political, and I don't really want to get into different questions like that. I really just want to continue the dialogue and maybe try to find a solution for us all. So the, the first thing I want to talk about, there's a bunch of different solutions out there that have been put forward by people a lot smarter than me. So one issue is universal. Now, this is a highly controversial issue because it basically stands for the proposition that you will get paid a salary just for being the citizen of a country. That's it. You just have to be a citizen. People don't like that. Why? Because they say it disincentivizes work. Now, maybe a, a better answer is something like a hybrid UBI. Have you ever heard of the Alaska Permanent Fund? Well, what it is, it's a fund where big oil companies pay Alaska to drill there. It's a cost of doing business. So they pay them. And all that payment goes into the uh, state coffers, which then gets invested and out of that investment, every year, the citizens of Alaska get paid a minimum dividend. Now, similarly, that's big oil. What is the new big oil? Big data. Now, we all use social media. Um, we all go on there, we use it for free, but I want to posit to you that they're also using us for free. We go on there, and what do we do? We like, we click links, we share, we tweet. Now, it might surprise you to learn how much you're worth to each social media network. Facebook, you're worth $118, each user. Twitter, 71. Instagram, you're worth $18 to them. But what do we all get out of it? We get hearts, <laughs> likes, I, sending positive thoughts your way. So it's kind of like, it would be like if a pizza shop uh, opened up and said, come on in, make a pizza. So you and your friends go in and you make pizza and you prepare it, and you make this delicious pizza with all of your favorite toppings on it, and it smells terrific. And then, as you're about to go eat it, the pizza shop comes and says, we've got it from here, we'll go ahead and sell that. <laughs> so, you don't get to eat the pizza, but you can sure send photos of it to your friends, or you can like your friend's pizza, but you can't eat the pizza. So, my point is, is perhaps we could work out something similar to the Alaska Fund. So cost of doing business for these social media giants out there 
And full disclosure, like I said, I own a tech company. I should be held to the same standard. Maybe there should be some kind of cost of doing business on big data that we're producing. Now, another issue or another solution that I want to talk about is potentially alternative currencies, virtual currencies, cryptocurrencies. You can call a bunch of different names. So let's go back to my refugees from earlier. My refugees from earlier don't have access to the system as it is right now, right? What if we designed a different thing? If we can't all get a piece of the pie as it stands now, why don't we give them a different pie? So there's a bunch of different kinds of currencies out there right now, cryptocurrencies. There's Bitcoin, Ethereum, there's different local ones. And I'm not saying, as I said before, that these solutions are the right one or the only one. I'm merely trying to have you think about solutions. Now, let me give you a little bit of a background on blockchain currency, which is cryptocurrency. In a, in a typical currency, in a fiat currency, traditional, you have it issued by a centrally backed governmental actor, typically. But in cryptocurrency, that is distributed out on a ledger across a network. It's much more open. It's much less susceptible to fraud. You and I could interact with each other much easier. We don't need the third party over here to help us. Now, the interesting thing about all of this is cryptocurrencies also can be used, or blockchain technology can be used for voting. It could make a much more open society. And I'm not saying, of course, like I said, that this is the only issue or the only solution, but it's one. Uh, Bill Gates has recently uh, talked about taxing robots. But we're not taxing robots, right? What does that mean? We're taxing those who have the robots, who have the technology. Um, that's one solution. And I guess my point being, I want to leave you guys in conclusion with is this. It's not a 1% problem, it's not a 99% problem, it's not a refugee problem, it's not a your problem, a my problem. It's an our problem. I want to take you back again to the refugees and us all going forward. Will we be digital refugees in an automated world? Is it going to be your son or your daughter, or your husband, or wife, out there on the streets in X amount of years in this automated world. It's not just me talking about this. Warren Buffett, one of the richest men in the world, thinks it's an issue. Bill Gates, one of the richest men in the world, thinks this is an issue. If even they think it's an issue, I think we should be also thinking about it. So my challenge to all of you is to join me in continuing the dialogue and trying to come up with a solution to this issue, wealth inequality. Thank you.